in violation of international law, Russia held sham presidential elections in the occupied territories of Ukraine. But this was far from the only violation. The terrorist attacks against Ukrainian cities continue. Meanwhile, several European intelligence services warn about the possibility of Russian aggression against the West. You're listening to the podcast Explaining Ukraine. The Explaining Ukraine podcast is produced by Ukraine World, an English language website about Ukraine. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko, I'm a Ukrainian philosopher, journalist, and chief editor of Ukraine World. I invite you to a regular conversation between my colleagues Anastasia Heresimchuk and Darya Sinayevska, journalists and analysts at Ukraine World. They analyzed key events in and around Ukraine during the last week. Let me remind you that Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the largest Ukrainian media NGOs. Let me also remind you that you can support our work at patreon.com slash ukraineworld. We provide exclusive content for our patrons. You can also support our volunteer trips to the front lines at PayPal, ukraine.resistinggmail.com. You can find these links in the description of this episode. For three days, from the 15th to the 17th of March, the world was observing a mockery called presidential elections in Russia. The process was going amidst election law violations. Apart from that, we all know that there was no real opposition to the newly elected president of Russia, and there was no access to free media and real media coverage of these elections. The result of so-called elections is that Putin has become a new old president of Russia. And before he starts his new uh, new tenure in power, he has been in power for already 24 years. But these violations were not the only ones. Russia has also violated the international law by conducting these pseudo-elections on the occupied territories of Ukraine. And except for the mockery itself, significant crime was committed during uh, these so-called elections that they were held and forced voting in temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine. And uh, as Ukrainian journalists have reported, according to official data from the um, occupation administrations, three 120,000 passports were uh, allegedly issued in the bombed out and uh, burned out Mariupol. An incredible and obvious fake number. But uh, you might wonder uh, of which purpose uh, stands behind these numbers. Basically, it provides a justification for, for the fraud to pump up the turnout figures and we know that more than 50 UN member states have condemned the so-called presidential elections uh, held by Russia in the occupied territories of Ukraine. Um, and um, Russia used various techniques to show loyalty, um, the, this lo- loyalty that uh, doesn't take place in uh, territory of uh, temporarily occupied parts of Ukraine. And it involved violations in the Ural Regional Center of Yekaterinburg and the city of Artemivsk, uh, Sverdlovsk region, because Russians arrived at the polling stations uh, and they found out that they had been disconnected from their permanent residence in order to vote in the puppet uh, DPR, Donetsk Public Republic, and the Zaporizhia Oblast of Ukraine. And therefore, these votes of rural residents will be, um, and uh, as we know, uh, they did statistically count it as votes cast in temporarily occupied uh, territories of Ukraine. We also know that Ukrainians who refused to to participate in uh, pseudo-elections were detained and such detentions um, were recorded in Donetsk, Zaporizhia and uh, Kherson oblasts. And the detainees were taken to the occupation, uh, occupational like police stations where they uh, wrote explanations you know, to the occupiers about why. Uh, they would not participate in these uh, elections. And uh, according to sources, uh, there were 249 such cases of detention, after which the um, occupiers began to conceal the information. 
In addition, unlike the September elections, you remember the one uh, that were uh, held for uh, local authorities, the occupiers increased the number of security forces during uh, early voting. For every member of the so-called election commission, there were up to three security forces who uh, controlled voters during the voting. Uh, in order to artificially increase the turnout at the uh, this so-called elections, the occupiers resorted to innovative attempts. For example, they launched um, like five buses with signs on them polling stations. And as soon as the driver saw people at the bus stops, uh, the uh, like bus stopped and people were forced to take part in these elections. And for the first time, the occupiers decided not to transport um, those people to like polling stations, but simply send security forces and members of election commissions to the enterprises where they forced everyone to vote on the spot. So during both early and general voting, members of this um, illegal election commissions and occupational uh, security forces Uh, supervised people who voted at some polling stations. We know that soldiers entered the um, like um, places where the voters were supposed to indicate their um, will and to uh, have uh, a vote. Russians delivered a ballot box to homes of Ukrainians at temporarily occupied territories along with soldiers with uh, machine guns and shamelessly Putin told I thought that the turnover would be good, but I didn't even expect them to be like this. So we know that Putin continues and plays along with this Russian sentiments to Stalin, who once said, it doesn't matter how they vote, it matters who counts. See, you you almost uh, can sense this Orwellian motive. Uh, like Putin's party in power has even introduced a special Uh, electronic like application for gadgets for voting and using it um, v- voters um, have to report their choices via geolocated text messages and another trick was to you know extend the voting period to three days so that they covered a working day which is friday and um, like election chance chats were set up at various enterprises to give instructions on how to get off work and go to polls in order to vote So, along with sim- like simulating support for Putin in uh, temporarily occupied territories, one might wonder what does the totalitarian regime need for these elections? And here I can say that autocrat relies on the support of the so-called selectorate. He's not interested in the opinion or positions of the majority of voters. In uh, non-democratic regimes, this selectorate is defined as those who are willing to support the government for personal be- benefits. And those personal benefits uh, can be of various nature. It, it can be money, career opportunities, or even the absence of direct repressions, which are um, widely popular in Russia. In this type of um, like voters, the ruling regime lies uh, like relies on for like its personal political preservation rather than some like democratic values. And we know that um, under the model of this so-called uh, electoral autocracy, elections turn into a kind of right of uh, passage for the nomenclature. What does it mean? It means testing the selectorate for its ability to preserve the status quo and thus strengthen and reproduce the power in uh, like the power of the permanent leader. So it's not a joke, and I want to be extremely clear here. We see that for a while the Eurosceptics far movements gain support in search of a firm hand, a leader of a steadfast will. In Russian case, there is nothing to brag about. It's about a revival of total- totalitarianism. And it's real. I mean, if we take the basics of political science, totalitarian regime is the regime of transformation of classes into the masses, displacement of the party system with central support for power structures, with its fragmented but still ideology, which in Russian case, um, premises are mm, like necromantic adorance of Stalin, what in Russian they call Tsari Boje, 
that means the merge of civil and religious power, and thus everyone who is against Putin is perceived heretic, who is against the God. Indeed, uh, what you've just told, Dasha, is uh, something um, like unbelievable for people who are used to live in democracy and uh, for people who live in states where the law is... Um, is obeyed and where the law is respected. So uh, while looking at what was going on at this so during these so-called Russian presidential elections, um, it's difficult to believe that it's not like a comedy show or absurd movie, but that's the reality. And what is extremely shocking here is that uh, people in Russia do not pay attention to this kind of Uh, violations and the majority of Russians just take the reality the way it is without asking any questions and without uh, putting these results uh, under question. So they they are actually happy with with their choice, even though uh, the uh, real numbers, uh, like the uh, results of the elections, were actually uh, rather drew uh, by the uh, Russian authorities. They are not real. But still, people do not ask any questions. And talking about the, um, I just want to add uh, some some thoughts about what was going on in the occupied territories of Ukraine. Um, if uh, we heard about some cases of sabotage of elections in uh, uh, in the Russian territories, I mean these these were just sporadic cases when some people uh, used. Molotov cocktails or something like that to uh, disrupt the process, which didn't have actually any real results. Like these were uh, isolated cases. Uh, in the occupied territories of Ukraine, people who uh, are against uh, occupation, who are waiting for the liberation, who didn't want to take part in these elections, they couldn't take any kind of actions like that. Uh, they couldn't show uh, their resistance. They couldn't show their unwillingness to vote because um, they are under grave danger. And if they did so, uh, the consequences for them might be tragic. And if we talk about the results of these so-called presidential elections in the occupied territories, like the outcomes for these territories uh, might be uh, even worse than the outcomes of the occupation itself. What I mean here is that uh, this imitation of legitimacy of current Russian power, because like, one of the aims of conducting these elections in the occupied territories war was uh, like a solid legitimization of Putin's rule over the occupied territories. So after that, after the imitation of the fact that... Uh, Ukrainians on the in the occupied territories supported Putin. He has his hands even more free to act the way he wants. And some analysts predict that um, after the elections, the repressions might become even more massive and even more cruel. And um, we know about the fact that uh, people from the occupied territories are forcefully uh, mobilized to the Russian army. So after After the elections, this process may get even more, more intense. And um, talking about the violation of international law by Russia, I want to move to another instances of how Russia violates this law. And uh, I want to talk about the difficult, tragic topic uh, about Russian attacks against Ukrainian cities. And um, we talk about it quite often and we tell you about the devastating effects of Russian missile and drone attacks on Ukrainian peaceful cities. So um, sometimes we don't tell about it, especially lately, but even though we don't do it, it doesn't mean that they stopped. Uh, Ukrainians are suffering from constant attacks, but the cruel uh, reality is that um, lately we just think about uh, the um, if it's worth mentioning or not, and we select like the most devastating attacks. And like sometimes we just just don't talk about those cases, those attacks where 
just several people died, were killed, or only um, premises like buildings were damaged. And that's that's actually very scary. It's terrible reality of the war because like we just don't tell about small amount of, of casualties. But even one lost life, even, I don't know, several wounded people, it's uh, already a tragedy for the country. Uh, this week, um, the last week was um, was marked with tragic events, and that is why we are raising this topic. Um, e- even though they were regular, let's call it regular attacks by Russian forces on Ukrainian cities, where uh, as the result of which, uh, like not a huge amount of people suffered, uh, like for example, a drone attack um, on Vinnytsia, where the dro- a drone hit the residential building, uh, apartment building, and three people were wounded, or a drone attack on Sumy region and on the Sumy city itself, uh, under which three people were killed and 14 wounded. Uh, they were more massive and brutal attacks. And here I want to tell you about the, the bloodiest and very treacherous attack on Odessa, uh, which took place on the 15th of March. So Russia used two ballistic missiles uh, to hit a residential area. And as a result of this attack, 21 person, 21 uh, Odessa residents were killed and 74 were wounded. And I don't, I, I will not even talk about the damage caused to buildings because in this regard, uh, all those buildings, infrastructure um, aren't of paramount importance. The tragedy here is the number of lives lost. And um, what is the most treacherous and brutal about this attack that um, the Russians used the double tap tactics. It means that um, they launched the first ballistic missile and after some time they hit the same place with the second ballistic missile. The aim of these tactics is not uh, only to kill civilians and cause huge damage to civilians, but also to kill those people who are rescuing civilians. And these tactics worked perfectly well for Russians because they killed not only uh, residents of Odessa, they killed paramedics, police officers, rescue workers who came to the uh, to the site of the tragedy to help Those people who suffered from the first attack, uh, they were also coping with the consequences of the first attack, uh, like uh, firefighters were trying to cope with a huge fire that uh, was in one of the buildings that was ruined after the first attack. And um, this place actually was a residential area and uh, there were no military objects nearby. And... um, Like this statement I've just made, made, it's not new. I mean, every time Russia hits Ukrainian cities, there are no military objects nearby. But in this case, like, um, there is no place even for speculations about possible possible presence of some military objects. Because I I live um, close to the place where this happened in, in Odessa. And um, I know this area very well. And the attack took place like very close to the big park I usually walk uh, in. So it's just 10 minutes walk from from there. So my personal experience was quite painful, but um, just not to get emotional and not to talk about this painful experience, I just want to state that no military objects are there. It was uh, Friday, it was a working day, and the attack took place closer to noon, to the noon. So there were lots of people outdoors, some people were at their homes. And um, that day was rainy in Odessa, and uh, even though I didn't, of course, I didn't go to the place of uh, this hit, missile hit, I saw so many photos and videos online, and... um, it was a rainy day, as I've told, and there were literal, literally rivers of blood on the streets uh, there uh, where the missile hit. So people were just 
doing their business, going somewhere. By the way, there, there are several schools and the kindergarten close to that place. Luckily, no children suffered. Uh, they managed, they had the several minutes to hide in the uh, basement, in the bomb shelter. So luckily, they were all safe and sound. So Russia doesn't stop shocking Ukrainians and the world in, in general by these brutal attacks. And they show that what they can do very well is to fight with civilians. And um, this attack on Odessa actually wasn't the only uh, bloody one. Uh, lately, especially over the last week, the Sumer region, uh, and I mean the uh, areas of this region that are close to the Russian border, are uh, heavily suffering, severely suffering from Russian attacks. Uh, the border areas um, or areas that are close to the front lines always suffer from Russian attacks and the Ukrainian authorities call on the local population to um, evacuate from those areas. Uh, but I'm telling about um, the um, bigger extent of these attacks uh, because what is going on there now is... Um, something much more severe than what we are used to. Uh, so uh, the local uh, authorities and locals say that actually n now Russia is erasing uh, territories of Sumer region that are close to borders. Uh, and uh, only in on the 17th of March, the uh, residents there heard about 500 explosions. Uh, Russians um, dropped 200 aerial bombs, and that's an immense amount. Mm, and uh, even though the evacuation started earlier, not uh, all the residents of these places wanted to leave their homes, and uh, now they have to do it under the constant shelling, and uh, Russians are using all the possible means to erase those territories from the first surface of Earth. They're using uh, attacks from air, they're using ballistic missiles, so everything they have in their hands they are using to destroy uh, lives of Ukrainian people and to take their lives. And uh, some, some military say that um, actually Russians, the Russians are destroying Ukrainian uh, population as a revenge for their failed initial attempt to take the whole Ukraine. So that's the position of cowards and evil power. And there is, unfortunately, there is nothing uh, unexpected here. But um, still, even though everyone has already understood what the Russian nature is, um, all these losses, all these tragedies are a huge pain and um, this pain gets deep in our hearts. And speaking of deepening of pain, we also have to acknowledge that the only right way to pay off this pain is to uh, attack this dictatorship in a manner that it would not be able to um, pr like pursue its interests its uh, and because its interests uh, is of imperial nature it's not uh, about uh, telling this or that state what to do it's about stating that there are sovereign states with their legitimate powers and their plans for the future and uh, you cannot ever, ever attack sovereign state and attack um, its population, its borders. And uh, in terms of um, this passage, uh, we have to also look deeper uh, into the situation on the front lines. The general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine reports that over the past day, 72 combat engagements took place between Ukrainian and Russian troops. The Russians lost 19 tanks, 17 armed vehicles, 34 artillery systems and other equipment. So the fighting remains fierce and you can imagine what uh, are the powers involved in this battle. 
Our defense forces repelled attacks at uh, various directions uh, near Kupiansk, Kuleman, Bakhmut, Ovdivka, Novopavlivka, um, uh, Orihiv, and uh, uh, other uh, directions. And Russia is deliberately launching a, w- a wave of rumors about a new offensive in Sumy and Chernihiv. Um, oblast, but the threat is constantly being observed, and the situation is being monitored, and the border is being strengthened. The representative of the Defense Intelligence of Ukraine added that in view of the hostilities in the Belgorod and Kursk regions in Russia, the invaders are trying to shift the focus and disseminate information in their own interest. And I shall remind that on 12th of March, a new Operation was launched in Russia by military units opposed um, to the situation which um, unfolded in the state, including the Russian Freedom Legion and Russian Volunteer Corps and the Siberian Battalion. Um, most active area is Novopavlivka, which is west of the town of Marinka, where the enemy has been concentrating its main force since the Ukrainian troops withdrew from Avdiivka for uh, understandable purposes. Uh, also, Robotina in Zaporizhia has become a like principal target for the Russians. Although the enemy is thro- throwing you know significant resources and fighting um, against you know Robotina, they suffer very heavy losses there, but do not give up their attempts. And we see that the Russians are switching to the tactics of small assault groups. At the same time, you see this Robotina place uh, is almost destroyed, but it remains under the control of uh, Ukrainian troops. So again, the situation at the front line remains tense. And uh, in uh, such harsh conditions, both sides are trying to find the means and solutions to achieve um, their superiority. And uh, Ukraine pursue attacks on oil facilities, uh, and these attacks are quite quite an effective tactic, in part because petrol prices can be a political problem for Putin. And this again circles us back to the idea of vulnerability and like anticity of uh, targeting resources which are vital for dictatorships. A series of strikes on the most powerful oil refineries in Russia has become a new campaign of Ukraine, and uh, this uh, this topic is being discussed uh, throughout Ukraine, Western media's expert circles. Overall, in 2024, there were 15 drone attacks on uh, th- 13 oil refineries in the nine regions of the Russian Federation, and of these, eight facilities sustained significant damages. It is estimated about 600,000 barrels of Russia's daily oil refining um, capacity has been knocked out by Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian uh, drone strikes. So this moves us to the idea that we are now trying to cut off these resources because we understand what it means to, um, you know, uh, experiencing, witnessing the war, the long war. And uh, as soon as the world understands that and uh, we, we see those narratives that are being on air and that uh, this idea of a dictatorship that has to be uh, cut off resources is is on air and it's a positive sign. But again, cutting resources now is about uh, restricting and limiting uh, the powers, the military capacities of Russia, because uh, we see the rhetoric of that side about portioning of Baltic states, portioning of Poland. Now it tries to portion um, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's territory. So in all those narratives with see the main motive, the motive of war against NATO. Indeed. And when we talk about the Russian rhetoric, we should understand that, yes, it might be only rhetoric, but there are no guarantees that these are only empty words. And as we see uh, in case of Russian aggression against Ukraine and before 
uh, Russia launched its uh, aggression against Ukraine in 2014. There were cases of Georgia or Moldova. So we know uh, the aggressive nature of this state. And uh, it means that Russia isn't only threatening, Russia is able to attack. Even, even if it's like Russia, Russian leadership can say whatever, they might say that they will ne- they would never attack anyone. They might say that they would destroy the whole world. Uh, and that's only about rhetoric. But we need to look at the actions. We also need to understand this, uh, this mechanism of how um, aggression works and how the appetites of uh, an aggressor grow. So the aggressor understands only the power. And if you show the uh, weakness, then it might, the aggressor, it might let the aggressor think that he has his hands free to do whatever he wants and he will not meet the proper response. That is why these talks in Europe about the proper response to Russia, about the readiness to protect themselves uh, about the understanding of this grave danger is extremely important. And even though it's quite late, uh, it's not. Um, it's still not too late. I mean, if uh, if this understanding came to minds of European leaders earlier, the devastating devastating consequences might have been avoided and Russia wouldn't adapt to the new reality that fast and effectively. But still, it's better to understand it and get ready for uh, for uh, the possible Russian aggression than to keep ignoring these facts. Putin might prepare the attack on the NATO states already in 2024. That's the information from the German intelligence service analysis. And according to the sources, Russia is getting ready for a fundamental conflict with the West. Quite alarming, isn't it? Mm, And the reorganization of Russian army, uh, the movement of its troops, missile deployment on uh, on its Western borders are actually the evidence of uh, Russia being in a state of uh, getting ready for something big and serious. And if Russia continues these actions and keep their pace, it might double its military capacities over the next five years. So if Russia will if Russia don't attack all the NATO states or if Russia doesn't attack um, the western part of Europe, it doesn't mean that um, it doesn't mean that it's will not attack separate states, especially in Baltics or in the Eastern Europe. So the Baltic states, Finland, uh, Finland or Poland, are under the biggest uh, danger from Russia. So if Russia doesn't um, attack directly or immediately, it doesn't mean that it will not attack asymmetrically and after that attacks uh, directly. And these asymmetrical attacks is what the world has been observing for for long years. And uh, without going to instances in history like interference with elections or sending spies to the Western state, I just want to mention the current, a current example of this uh, asymmetrical threat. Uh, while uh, quite recently the Russians were testing their electronic warfare systems in Kaliningrad Oblast, and they weakened the GPS signal over NATO states, which resulted in uh, problems for NATO air forces. So it's quite a telling example of what Russia is capable to do. The Estonian intelligence draw, drew the same conclusion as the German intelligence, And um, according to it, uh, Russia is reorganizing its army for conflict with NATO. And uh, according to Estonian intelligence, this conflict is possible during the next decade. Uh, What is important here is that uh, Russian military, military leadership drew lessons from the 
uh, from their mistakes uh, in the war with Ukraine. And Russian military adapt to current reality unexpectedly fast. Unexpectedly fast is actually what was told by Europeans. It's not my uh, phrase. Uh, and I just want to emphasize this uh, unexpectedly part because Actually, Ukraine was warning the West about Russian ability to adapt to current reality, about Russian ability to avoid the negative effects of sanctions, about Russian ability to invest everything in the military sphere at the expense of normal standards of life of their citizens. And uh, what what we are seeing now, what we are observing, is actually what was uh, what Ukraine was warning about. And uh, now Russia has raised its military budget and uh, the increased the number of soldiers. Uh, the the military production companies are working like the whole days, nonstop, uh, to produce as much weaponry as possible. What is also alarming is that uh, even though the Russian main tactics of waging war is quite old and Soviet style, they are fighting with uh, heavy weapons and they are people, they are launching meat grinder assaults, still um, taking into account those mistakes uh, they made on the battlefields in Ukraine and taking into account the necessity of changing certain tactics in the modern warfare Russian, Russians are the Russians are also working on on the uh, developing modern technology and they are um, working on creating the whole robotic systems to deploy on the battlefields and these systems wouldn't require uh, soldiers presence actually and it's also very alarming, especially for the Western states. Earlier, some uh, some European media told about uh, the Russian threat, and that's actually started from the very end of 2023, and the similar warnings were also disseminated uh, in uh, Western media in January 2024, so, for example, the German media Bild, um, referring to uh, some European intelligence sources, told that uh, said that um, Russia might attack uh, Europe already in the end of 2024 or in 2025, and the analysts and the representatives of intelligence. Um, told about uh, this period, said about this period, just because um, they are looking at the events that are going on in the USA. So the USA is in, in the election period, and according to those sources, Russia might use the transitional uh, period in the USA after the election. So um, when the newly elected president hasn't, uh, taking its power yet, and the previous president is leaving uh, his position. So this interim period uh, might be uh, might be favorable for Russia to uh, launch some aggressive actions. And um, in the same period, it was the end of 2023, the beginning of 2024. The head of the military, NATO Military Committee, Admiral Rob ba uh, Bauer, uh, told that he said that Europe should get ready for the total war with Russia. Uh, and in the same manner, the German um, Defense Minister Boris Pistorius told that um, now Europe is facing the biggest threat over the last 30 years, and uh, the Russian attack is possible within the next five, eight years. So we see that the uh, European leaders, the NATO leaders, understand the uh, the real danger. And um, according to Ukrainian analysts and military, uh, Europe doesn't actually have 10 or 8 years. According to the estimates of our military analysts, Russia might be ready to attack within the next 2-3 years. And 
to draw this conclusion, it's necessary to understand the very nature of uh, Russian state and uh, the Russian people, uh, because these people are ready to suffer any deprivations. Uh, they will lack uh, the financing of uh, education, healthcare. They will suffer from low standards of life, but they will they will invest everything, every possible effort, and all the funds uh, to increase their military capabilities. And that's uh, what history shows to us. So to understand the severity, the seriousness of this threat, it's just necessary to observe. It's necessary to understand the Russian actions, to understand the nature of their state, and to look at the historical examples. And it is necessary to act until it's not too late. This was a podcast explaining Ukraine by Ukraine World, an English-language website about Ukraine. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm the chief editor of Ukraine World. This was a regular conversation between my colleagues Anastasia Hrasimchuk and Darya Sanayevska, journalists and analysts at Ukraine World. They analyzed key events in and around Ukraine during the last week. Let me remind you that you can support our work at patreon.com slash Ukraine World. Uh, you can also support our volunteer trips to the front lines at PayPal, ukraine.resisting.gmail.com. You can find these links in the description of this episode. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine.